Yo, what's up guys? Tim Bratz here. I'm sitting down. We're gonna do another episode of Spill the Beans with my buddy, Caleb Pearson. Caleb, I met through a mastermind group actually a few years ago, about, uh, shoot, probably three years ago now. And uh, we're sitting in the room, we get, grab drinks, great dude, great values. Uh, him and his wife Ashley live actually right around the corner uh, from me and my wife Kate. And Ashley and Kate work out all the time, so like they're good friends of ours and, uh, and business uh, associates. We actually don't, haven't done any business together, but uh, and no, I, I bought my house, my beach house through them. So anyways, like Caleb coming here, he runs one of the largest, he had a big name brand brokerage uh, that was the biggest in the state of South Carolina. He built it all up when he was in his 20s and um, uh, has now since kind of departed from that brand, but runs one of the biggest brokerages in the entire state of South Carolina, has a huge retail brokerage side, and then he also invests. And so he flips houses. Um, when I met him a couple years ago, I was like, dude, you need to start buying and holding some stuff. And he started buying and holding uh, some multifamily. So he's got up to 200 units in about 18 months of putting his head down and looking for some deals. And absolutely lighting it up. He's trying to get to 500 units by the end of the year. And um, got a lot of good things going on. So he's just a sharp guy, very laid back, very lifestyle oriented. You guys are gonna love what he has to say. So check this out. Caleb Pearson, what's up, bro, homie? What's up, buddy? Dude, excited to have you here, man. Thank you for having me on. Dude, so uh, tell me a little bit about what you got going on right now. I know you got the brokerage, I know you got the investment side, I know you got uh, a lot of stuff going on. You're building the house on your on your own, but. Yeah. Uh, so, so dude, tell me about what's going on in the brokerage world, what's going on in the investment world, what are you seeing since, uh, since COVID hit and where the market is right now? Yeah, man, um, this is my 10th year now in real estate and it's, balls to the wall. It's the best I've ever seen the market. Um, like I think we're last year at this time, our brokerage team, we were probably at about, about 20 million. We're at like 35 million bucks already, only a quarter of the way through the year. Awesome, um, and it's really not from doing anything different than what we've been doing. Um, we're starting to see a lot of people You bring up COVID. We're getting a ton of people from like the Northeast that have been on the five year plan to get down here. COVID hit and they're, they're picking up the phone and they're just like, can't do this anymore we're coming down now and then with no houses on the market you're just seeing prices just skyrocket through Wh which which housing price ranges are, are going up the most you know i'm seeing luxury actually see the biggest jumps right now. really yeah luxury is getting a huge jump we're seeing what would you more, say is luxury a million plus yeah i'd say a million plus here in our market um it's just there's so much cash coming down here now which we i've never seen this much cash to where i mean we're putting houses on the market call it like we listed one last week or two weeks ago 800 sold for 890 <laughs> cash cash it's waving awesome. appraisals i mean we're 30 40 showings in a weekend um so the retail side is doing great the home flipping side's doing well um we're having a truck we're having trouble finding deals but the ones that we're finding that we're seeing profit margins are bigger by the time we buy it close on it and fix it up and go to sell it it's worth 25 more than we thought it was going to be worth. crazy dude. so yeah it's kind of a do you, do you think it's do you think it's uh like a fake inflation do you think it's a real inflation do you think there's real demand is it driving the prices up or do you think it's kind of a of a bubble do you think it'll pop what do you what are your thoughts on it you know i think it's going to keep going for a little while um i think it depends on the market you're in you know yeah, and think, charleston south carolina everybody wants to be here that's what i'm that's where i'm coming from and i think with covid happening people have realized they can be more virtual and now they're instead of living in Jersey and having to go to the office every day, all companies are figuring out that they can go virtual and they can have their employees go virtual. So those people that, they don't want to live in Jersey. They would, I mean, who wouldn't want to live in Charleston? Right. So we're seeing all these people from all directions around it's the not, country. Yeah, it's not it's nothing anti-Jersey. Yeah, it's yeah, just, nothing anti-Jersey. It's just pro-Charleston. It's yeah. like, dude, you got, you got weather, you got beaches, you got boating, you have architecture, you have food, you have everything down here. History, it's its just, it's an amazing, amazing place to live. So I mean, just look schools. at schools. Just look at the mastermind group we're in. We've got, what, four or five people that have already yeah. moved to Charleston yeah. just because they can work from anywhere. Yeah. And I'm still getting calls from people in the group that yeah. are like, hey, there's more. Tim says Charleston's good. Ron says Charleston's <laughs> good. Um, so that's, it's been a good source of, honestly, it's been a good yeah. source of leads for us. Yeah, dude. No, it's, it's awesome. What do you, um, 
You know what? You know what always amazes me, dude, is like when I was super broke in 2012 and I was running on Isle of Palms and I'm looking at all these houses. I'm like, what do these people do? Like, can you imagine if Zillow had some? Like, there was something like Zillow where you could just click on the house. You know what the what the the estimate price is. You know, imagine if they had that for like what each person did, what their occupation or what their business was. You know what I mean? Can you imagine that? And I, I always think like, what do these people do? How is there so much cash out there? And there's so many people. Like, I remember when I was in a, in a tight spot, I was like, where does all the money come from? Like there's, but there's so much abundance of access to capital and money and all these people are coming in buying million dollar houses with cash. Like- And young people too. Like what, where are you seeing their money come from? Um, what has your mindset around money been since you're like seeing all this stuff? You know, it's drastically changed since I first got into real estate. Um, especially now that I've starting to get, gotten into more of the luxury stuff. That's always been my, question too is where and how did these people get this wealthy yeah. and it's been, like I brought, brought up earlier younger people yeah. um, I'm seeing a lot of people that have like s built tech companies sold tech companies um, a lot of money in insurance a lot of money in banking yeah. financial advising a lot of money, real estate. Of money coming from real estate um, I don't know man money's just flowing right now it is. which scares me to a degree but it's it's also a, it's a good time to be in real estate yeah man no I mean it's it's uh you see everybody spending money it's getting stirred up in the economy it helps boost everything like that's why everything's appreciating it's why it's good look to have low interest rates easy access to capital to then go and, and stimulate the economy with that. like what are your and most of your investors what do they do they're entrepreneurs all my people are entrepreneurs dude like they uh, they have their own business they either launch products or they're selling their business and then they go and build another business and then sell that one and they just uh, a lot of real estate investors who are active flippers and operators yeah are doing the transactional thing and then they want to do something that's a little bit more passive also uh, and then I have people who kind of they fund they invest in my deals through kind of like their own friends and so like they kind of create their own fund yeah of their own friends and family um, I've got a lot of people who have hundred thousand to a million bucks in a 401k or a self-directed IRA that invest with us also. Uh, the the biggest investors own their own business, though. You know, like they're they're all entrepreneurs in some capacity, and, and I like them because they're not they're not breathing down your neck all the time either. You know, yeah, because they're like I'm, I'm too busy going and running my business and launching new product and generating capital and generating revenue over here. Tim, I just want to make sure I give you the money. You just make sure that the payment hits on a quarterly basis. Yeah. You know, and they're they're too busy to be breathing down your neck. Where where are we at with this and that and um, and that's okay, dude. I understand like there's some people who have uh, need attention and want to know what's going on with their, with their money and stuff. Um, but it's, it's a different mindset. When you talk to somebody who's got $100,000 and that's their last $100,000 and they're trying to invest it with you, dude, it's like they're clinging on for life versus, and, and it's almost like scarcity type mindset. It's definitely you know? what it is. Versus yeah. the abundance mindset is the entrepreneur's like, you know what, let me just go and make another $100,000 over here and I'll just keep on deploying it. And blah, blah. It, it's, yeah, I don't know when the shift occurs, um, but I think when you, when you realize that you can kind of like dictate what your value is and what you can dictate how much revenue and, and wealth that you can build or income you can create, um, is I think a big differenti differentiating factor. Um, I was never good at, at making money. I was never good at like transactionally making money. Um, what, I, what I was really good, like, you know, let's say there's three steps of building wealth. Earning money, saving money, and then investing your money. I wasn't really good at, at earning money. I, I lived on less than what I earned. Um, but what I was really good at is investing other people's money. Yeah. And that's how I built all my wealth, dude, is I invested other people's money and then made a spread because I was really good at that side of things. And that's how I, how I generated income. And now, because I know how to do that, now I know how to teach and coach and, uh, and I know how to flip and I've gotten better through that whole process. So now I can generate income and save it and invest it. But Y'all have gotten um, so good at attracting money now, too. Yeah. So we, good uh, at it. Dude, I think... I think you know, sales is one of those things where, or raising money, or anything, dude, is influence, right? And people think it's like, it's not sales though, it's influence, it's, and I think the best influence comes from educating people. And all we do, man, is we just talk about what we do all the time. It's doing this, right? Yeah. Sitting here, providing value for somebody else, 
they get to know me, they get to know you, and they're like, you know what, I want to invest with Caleb, you know, he seems like a legit dude, or I want to invest with Bratz, like, I like where his core values are, and I like where his family values are, and so, um, it's just getting to know people. I think when you build the trust, uh, and that's by social media, you can do that, like, that's how we met through the mastermind and through social media and stuff, but um, some of my best friends have come through Facebook and social media that we got to know each other through social media posts, you know, it's crazy. And once they know, like, and trust you, they, it's not a sales pitch getting capital from them. It's, it's just, and honestly, it's not even about the return. They, they've got discretionary money just sitting yeah. on the side sidelines. They'll just, they, yeah. they'll give it to you and, and, off and, of a handshake. And they have, to, they have to respect you from, yeah. for whatever you're investing in, you know? I, I don't think, and I've had people come to me and say, hey, will you invest in this, you know, this prop tech fund or something else? And it's, dude, it's not what people know me for, so I don't think, and maybe it's a self-limiting belief, um, but I don't think I can go raise money for you know, some sort of fintech company or prop tech company or something like that, that I, that's not something that I'm known for. So people respect me for real estate, so it's very easy for me to raise capital on real yeah. estate. I don't think, I, if I want to go start a restaurant, people will be like, dude, what are you, what are you doing? Like, mm. let's, let's step back and think about this whole thing. So I think when you're an authority and you can create yourself as an authority in some certain industry or some certain sector, uh, it's a lot easier to raise money, I think, in that sector. And I was always like, I'm the multifamily guy, I'm the apartment guy, like invest in apartments. And, and because you, I've become so niche, I've, I've become not only an expert, but an authority in that space. Yeah. And I think that's why people feel good about investing because, you know, I mean, reality is I've, I've done a lot of deals and I've done a lot of deals for a long time, so it's like, there's people, I, you know, I'll do more deals this month than most people do in their lifetime, you know yeah. what I mean? And so that gives a comfort level of, I know my money's safe, I know my money's secure, and um, you know, I find investors look for essentially three things, dude. They look for, what is, the, what is the asset, right? Like, what am I secured by? And real estate's an easy one because people know it's tangible and um, they can see, feel, and touch it. Um, what's the return? And the return comes from a couple of things. One is like, uh, is the reward worth the risk? You know, so that's that's obviously what what'll dictate the level of return. But it's also like, you know, you, we were talking offline. I got a deal the, on the Mountain House. We were talking about and bringing in a couple of partners on that, and uh, it it it's a good return for the for the um, for the deal. But you have access to other types of opportunities to actively invest a hundred thousand dollars in and get a way better return. Yeah. So you know, for most people, it'd be like, dude, this is a home run great deal but for somebody who's active in the investment side it's like you have to pay them a return that competes with what they could go and invest in otherwise yeah. you know is that what do you find it harder to raise money from the real estate guys because they have other opportunities yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I figured I, I, we run into the same thing yeah I, I would say um, especially the the newer real estate guys that are just they're generating revenue and and I think it's twofold I think I think one, they're reinvesting into their business. And secondly, they're just kind of a little bit green. Like early on, I, I was like, I'm not gonna invest passively and make 12% or 10% when I can actively invest and make 30% on my money. The, the difference is, dude, you're not comparing apples to apples. You're comparing apples to oranges. Yeah. Two very different things. And I think as you mature in this business, I think a lot of people, um, say, hey, let me make money here and keep on doing the transactional. Let me just passively invest it over here. And then this starts compounding way faster than people really think. It does. And, and, and I think that makes a big difference. Once you, once you taste this, the passive investments, um, you realize like, shit, I need to do more of that, right? I need to, I need to dump more money into that. But it, it, it's very difficult, especially for like the, um, I wouldn't say younger, but I would say newer type of investors who are just trying to like, get things rolling, you know what I mean? It took me, like we started building our portfolio two years ago um, because we were just transactional. We were flipping on, on wholesaling just constantly and then we bought a four unit and then when I figured out the cost egg and the depreciation side of it, that was the biggest game changer for me. Because oh. I'm good at generating cash and I'm, I, I'm an income generator. Yep. But then once I figured out, all right, well there's one and that offset so much of my taxes, then it was like, all right, now let's grow this faster and let's really start just plugging away because I'd rather give, I'd rather pay myself and buy new assets than yep. pay them the same. 
For sure, man. So and, that was the I, I think a lot of people don't realize realize that. Like when you are a when you are a um, real estate professional, you can offset earned income in real estate with your passive losses in real estate because you're a real estate professional. So they all throw it into one bucket. If you're a, a doctor, or if you're you know in the tech industry, or you have a brick and mortar business, and you passively invest in real estate. You have passive income, and you can offset that passive income with passive losses, but you cannot offset your active income with passive losses. You and I are different because we can go and buy uh, passive investments and buy apartment buildings, and we can offset our earned income. Correct. You know, yep. the brokerage yep. income, the flipping income, the education income, the, um, the wholesale income, all the things that we generate as earned income with our passive losses, and you can accelerate depreciation. You can do. But I wish somebody had taught me that eight years ago. Bro, it's when a I game first, changer. When I was early on in if real estate. You, it is a game changer. There's no reason that a real estate professional, a real estate agent, a real estate investor, anybody that's spending, what is it, 700 hours a year? Uh, yeah, is that I, what it is? Uh, I don't even know what it is, but it's it's essentially like 20 hours a week or yeah, something. Yeah, whoever's like that. considered a real estate professional, there's no reason for them not, not to be buying assets and cost second. Yeah, dude. No reason. Because I was writing huge tax checks for years, and then it just, two years ago, it's been a I mean, that's been the biggest game changer for me in all my business. For sure. I think, I think, uh, and it, so, so here's, here's a hack. If you are, so I got a good buddy, he's got an eight figure a year trucking business and he's a full time, he's got, he's not in, in real estate, but he wants to invest in real estate, but he wants to offset his seven figure a year income um, with real estate. He couldn't do it because he's seen as a full time trucking business yeah. owner. His wife yeah. is a real estate yeah, investor. Really so his wife became a real estate professional. They file their taxes jointly. Yeah. And now, and by the way, I'm not a CPA, so talk to your CPA on this. But because they file their taxes jointly, she can offset their passive loss, their, or his earned income, income with yeah. their passive losses from real estate on the, on the depreciation side. And dude, it, it changed everything for them. I mean, think about if you're gonna pay Uncle Sam 200 grand, or you can take 200 grand and plug it into a 20% down on a million dollar property, like that is a massive change in your wealth. For sure. It's, it's, and that's, I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is like the tax code was written by people who can, who had power, right? Who had power, people with money, who had money. Wealth has been measured in land ownership since the beginning of civilization, you know? So like if the landowners have the money, and the money has the power, and the power has the influence, and the influence dictates the tax code, guess what, dude? It all funnels downstream to starting out with, with landlords. So that's why there's so many tax benefits to landowners. And if you're not in real estate, like you need to be in real estate, or your spouse needs to be in real estate, so that way you can benefit. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to business owners, but dude, once you're a, once you're a landlord and you're a landowner, um, that's the difference. And even if you're in real estate, if you're doing just transactional stuff, you cannot benefit the same way as you can if you're owning and holding. Agreed. Property. You have to learn the tax piece. For have sure. To. For sure. And I, then not only is that money gone when you give to Uncle Sam, but let's say you, in that same scenario, you give two hundred thousand dollars as a down payment down on a million dollar property. That money's gone if it goes to Uncle Sam. This one, you own the asset. Hopefully, it appreciates, but it still pays you every month. So it's it's not only the money that you save from not paying taxes, but because you reinvest it, you're creating a greater spread. Correct. Right. Like so. You're saving money and you're increasing income. So look like look at that gap of what that does there. And it it changes so fast. I mean, like I'm not doing it on the scale that you are, but we went from zero to 200 doors in like 18 months. Right. And everybody's like, uh, it's what, what do you think it was for you guys to overcome the limiting beliefs in your head of saying, hey, can I go and pick up to 100 doors, 50 doors, 200 doors, like? Like, what did the mindset look like beforehand, and what like was the impetus to finally like jump on to 200 doors and make that happen? Um, watching what you did was one thing. Um, learning so, how you so guys seeing did it. seeing other people do it, yeah, you're like, hey, if this guy can do it, I can do it, right? Yeah, like, that's so a I, cool testimony. I'd say I, I had a little bit of limiting belief about what I could afford. Um, I don't know that I thought that I had the cash to, to do it. Yeah, um, everybody thinks they gotta use their own money, right? Yeah, which we used a lot of our own cash to, to really get ramped up and going which, because I had a few businesses that were doing well. Um, so figuring out the finance piece to it was probably the most important thing because I was good at finding deals, I just didn't know how to take them down and, yep. and buy them myself. Yep. Now that I know how to do that, I mean, 
we're not taking down what was the one that y'all just bought 500 552 552 yesterday. units yeah. um we're not there yet but we're still taking down fairly large deals and raising capital is not as hard as i thought and by the way dude that was my biggest deal i've ever done right so it's no like, that's a massive this deal is, though it's uh yeah, it's stabilized value is gonna be over 100 million bucks, man. It's like I remember when my goal was a hundred million dollar portfolio. I thought it'd be set up for life, and now like we're taking them down in single deals. It's crazy. Yeah, that's a you money know? deal. Uh, but it goes back to your point. It's like, dude, you never like you didn't realize how quickly this stuff compounds. Like you yeah. get to 200 doors in 18 months. Like my goal in 2014 was a hundred million dollar portfolio. Yeah. 2015 was a hundred million dollar portfolio, and so it's like. It's, it's amazing how big, it, like we're over $400 million. Well, know? it's crazy what comes to you too. Another big change in my business was once I started saying no to things, like I used to, anybody that would bring me an opportunity, I would say yes to it and I'd try to please everybody yeah. and start small businesses. Yeah. And now I say no to almost everything that comes to me. Mm -hmm. And it seems like big opportunities have started like falling in my lap. All these doors that we bought have been deals that I would have not had the time or focus or energy to really pour into these deals and I would have passed up on them. Yep. Um, but they make way bigger differences than starting these small companies that would do 50 to 150 grand a year. Yep. Dude, totally. I, I heard a quote, it was it said the difference between successful people and really successful people is really successful people say no to almost everything. Yeah. And that's been a game changer for me too, man. Like I, I have, uh, you know, people hit me up on social, like opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. And if it's a real estate deal, you got to know who to funnel it to. Yeah. You know, so it's not me looking at everything. I funnel that. If they want to invest, I funnel it to you know Fatty. If they yeah. want to, if they want to do a deal or send us a deal, I funnel it to Nick. If there's some sort of operations or JV partner or supplier vendor, whatever, goes to my COO Matt. Um, and dude, like I've, I've realized that like the only thing I should be spending my time on is stuff like this, developing content, because it feeds those funnels. And there's a lot of shiny objects, man. I mean, we see. I mean, how many people are talking about Bitcoin right now? It's like oh, over sixty thousand dollars of Bitcoin. Yeah. These e-commerce stores. But shit, I got I got good friends who are making boatloads of money, flipping like sports cards. Yeah. Like, like they're like they're buying a, a Jordan rookie card and it goes up a hundred thousand dollars in in twelve months or something. Create like what? And it's just uh, it's remarkable how much, how many different opportunities are out there, and I think again, to your point, is like the differentiating factor is like if you chase shiny objects and you try to be a jack of all trades, you're a master of none. And it's like, it's like, the, uh, it's like the doctors, right? Like if you can be a general practitioner and help everybody and come in for anything that you have going on, then you can make good income. You can make 150 grand a year. But dude, if you are the best heart surgeon in the world, if you are the best foot surgeon in the world, if you are the best I don't even know, back surgeon, spine surgeon, like if you are a specialist, you can make 800,000 to multiple, multiple millions of dollars for this exact same amount of time just by focusing on, um, you know, uh, focusing on, on that one thing and being an expert and then being seen as an authority. That's what y'all have done so well, is people know y'all strictly as the multifamily guys. That's it. Yeah, people I think y'all people brain out a little bit into what, self-storage? Yeah, yeah, but only to the extent, like, and I've been very clear to people that like, the only reason I invest in self-storage is to invest with other operators who are experts in yeah. self-storage. So we have access to extra capital once in a while, and we'll just go and invest in their deals, but it's not me and my team doing that anymore. I know enough about it where I can step in, my team can step in, we know the management companies, we know enough other operators where we can bring somebody in if that operator ended up shit in the bed. Uh, but it's not us operating it, man. I'm gonna let somebody else focus on that. Same thing with like mobile home. I know you just bought a mobile home park, right? Yeah. So, like I would love to get in more mobile homes. I know that they cash flow like crazy. It's my best performing asset that we own. Really? I mean, it's not even close. Like it's- How many units do you have? The 36 mobile home pads, so we don't own any of the trailers. That was my uh, next question. Yeah, it's eight apartment complex, eight apartment doors, a triplex and two single families all on the same property. So it's- 36 so it's 36 pads, pads eight, plus eight, an eight unit, eight, apartment, eight unit apartment, a triplex and a duplex? A triplex and two single families. And two singles. Yep. Um, but man, it, it's our best as far as collections. Um, so it was about 49, 50 units or something like that? Yeah, it's about. And then we raised rents as soon as we jumped, as soon as we came in, no pushback, nobody moved out. Did you guys make any improvements to the property before you bumped rents? Um, no. 
No. I mean, we're, we're gradually, like the two single families need to be fully renovated, so we're fully renovating those, but we didn't do anything that affected the rest of the tenants. Really? Yeah. And, and you got no pushback from it? No pushback. Interesting. The, uh, the last, Mobile, last week I sat down with, with Nate Hershberg and we were talking about like not just going in and, and th bumping up the rents immediately because sometimes people flip out about it like F you, the new landlords trying to get rich and stuff. And, um, and so like when, whenever I do it, I try to improve the, the at least the exterior, That's some how we of do the, the amenities, apartments. Yeah. right? And then I go and have a conversation with the existing tenant base and bump everything up. So it's just, it's, I'm not, dude, I'm not saying one's right or wrong because obviously if you didn't get any blowback, Maybe it's a self-limiting belief that we have to even do all that stuff. Now, I've, I've been around the block a few times, so I know with apartments, it's a little bit tougher. It's way but different. Yeah, it's interesting I mean, that you don't have to do that. Well, like, or look at a mobile home. Here. Those things, like, these things have been there for 10 to 20 years. Those things, like, grow roots where they are. Yeah. They have trees, yeah. and some of them have trees that have grown up that are too large for them to even get the mobile home out of. Like, those people are not to sound, not, not to make it sound like we're taking advantage of them, but, like, they're kind of stuck. Yeah, they're um, not going anywhere. Yeah, they're not going right, it anywhere. Costs, dude, it's cost five grand just to move one of those things. You and know? dude, their brothers, cousins, sisters all live in there. I mean, it's it's a small community, but I mean, we we bumped their lot rents from 290 to 320, which is a pretty big percentage jump. 10 percent, yeah. Yeah, and no pushback. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm telling I mean, you, they it's cash not like you're bumping great. it by 150 dollars a month. You know what I mean? Uh, and maybe that's the difference. Maybe I'm going in and buying apartment buildings that are rented for 600 and I'm bumping it up to 750 or 800. Yeah. But we got to show the improvements, right? Like, yeah, that's a much harder of a gap than uh, than bumping up by 30 bucks a month, which, you know, dude, for, for some people in that space, like that's a that's a lot of money Yeah. Um, on a monthly basis. But at the same time, it's kind of a drop in the bucket as well. And it costs them so much to get those things out of there. Yeah. To pull the mobile homes out and move them. They Have you had them. anybody move out and leave it? None. No, not uh, yet. No turnover. Well, we only owned it for a few months, so I'm sure it'll happen at some point. Yep. Uh, how'd you find that apart, or how'd you find that mobile home park? Um, it was actually real estate. So I've kind of gotten the name as I had a reputation of we were a super aggressive retail team for a long time, and now I've kind of built a brand as I'm the investor real estate agent in town. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of the younger guys will bring me deals, and basically they'll first they'll see if I'll buy it. Um, they'll try to ask me. They'll try to get my expertise on how to monetize it. Um, I prefer to buy anything. I've done that for years. Is I was the agent that made other people rich. Now it's kind of, I'm hoping that these agents bring me deals and I'm the one that takes them down. Or, yep. um, so that one came from a real estate agent and I just let him represent me in the deal and I had it wholesale. So the only, like, they, they make the commission on it. They make the commission on it. You buy it, and then they're, they're out of it, right? You're not giving them equity. No, he got no like equity that. in it. But he made like 60 grand off the deal. Oh, it is. So he was yeah. happy. Hell yeah. So then, uh, where'd you raise the private money from? Where'd um, you use your I money? actually used my own capital, and we, used, we went to a small local bank, and they saw the numbers, and I mean, it got approved in like three days. Really? Yeah, they were like, this is a no brainer. Yeah. This was a mistake I made. That guy brought it to me, and I saw the numbers, and I knew it was a good deal. So I turned around, and I had it wholesold, wholesale, wholesold for about, a, I think it was 150 grand. And then I never went and looked at it. He went and looked, my investor went and looked at it, and then about a week later, after I'd already signed the contract, we drove over there, and I'm walking the property, and I'm like, shit. Yeah, this was the this. worst mistake. I, can, I, this, I can't believe I sold this to this guy. And then COVID hit, um, and they were, you can't evict anybody, and they were. Yeah. So he panicked and backed out of the deal. Yeah. And then I was, it was too good of a deal for me to just let go. So I closed on it. And, and the bank was still giving you a loan during the whole COVID thing. Huh? Yeah, the bank. Banks, or, or did this get delayed like twelve? It got months? it got delayed a few months, but the bank still gave me the loan on it. And we closed on it. We put like twenty percent down on a million. I think we paid like a million one, million, yeah. million one fifty something. Like that. Yeah. Dude, that's remarkable, man. And then um, as far as management goes, how have you been managing that? Just our local property manager. We don't so, have our own property so manager. So you use a property manager, they go out there, they manage the whole thing, they handle all that stuff. Yeah. And, and knock on wood, I think they're at 100% collections. Yeah. I mean, it's night and day from my other properties. Yeah. Do you think it's, do you think it's a difference in tenant class? Do you think it's a difference in area? Do you think it's a difference in management? Or is it the same management on Same board? management manages all of my stuff. Um, what about the, the class of tenants or how the tenants were qualified before they came in? So they were all, it was, a, there was an old man that basically he went up there three days a week and sat in one of the single, the single families 
and he, I guess, screened all the tenants. But it, if I had to guess, half the people in there are related to each other. Yeah. I mean, it's a small community and um, all the same demographic. It's just, I, we, haven't had to, we haven't had to screen any tenants, and we haven't had to fill any of them. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, man. It's, like I said, knock on wood, it's good. They're, they're all paying. It's awesome, man. And then what's the uh, what's the exit strategy? You plan on getting your money back out? Are you gonna refinance in a few years, or are you gonna? We'll refi what's once we get the once we get the financials up and get it stabilized. I mean, I think we can bump all the lot rents to like three fifty, and we can max out all the um, apartments and the single families and pull all our own cash out of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Dude. Probably in about a year. Um, and you use a local bank for that? Yep, I love local banks for creative prop. I mean, that was like a creative deal. It wasn't a traditional deal that like a Bank of America would like. No, no, you can't. You can't go to a big national bank. You can't go to an agency lender. You on some of the like the more creative type stuff, the things that like need a little bit more work, and there's a story around it. Usually, the local bank is best for like acquisition financing. Yeah. Do you think you'll refinance it with them, or do you think you're going to turn around and refinance it? I don't even know. Do, do agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, do they lend on? You know, I don't even know the answer to that one, to be honest. You talked to on it. People told me that a long time ago, is go to all your small banks and start building relationships, and then start putting accounts at some small banks, and um, we've done that, and those guys like beg you for deals after a while. Really? Once they learn, once they like trust, and they see that you're buying good quality deals and good quality assets, they they're still, they, they're constantly asking you for what else, what's next, what's next. Yeah, yeah. They have limits, they set limits on how much they'll lend you. Well, how big are these banks that you're using? Like yeah. one or two branch banks, real small banks. Yeah. yeah, but then you cap out with with how much you can borrow from them, correct? Yeah, I mean like, both of the small, small banks we use cap us out at two million bucks. Yeah. And then anything above that, it's gotta go through a serious scrutiny. Yeah. So like, as far as underwriting. So like, I do. You, you come across a lot of deals. Um, you broker the stuff in the luxury areas. You bought stuff in B class areas, C class areas. Uh, what what area type do you like to gravitate towards, um, and why? So, I used to not really discriminate, not buy in any area. B and I've never done A, but we used to do it. B and C. Now, if we buy something in C, if it's multifamily, we flip it. I, I hate C class apartments. Um, B class, we keep, we love. Um, tenants pay, they don't ruin the places. C class, I like to get in and get out as fast as I can before my air conditioning units get stolen. Um, refrigerators get stolen as you put stuff it's in. It's almost like D class. You know? <laughs> Dude, I've had, I've gotten my ass kicked. Um, yeah. I mean, like I'll give you an example. We just, we bought an 11 unit for 200 grand here in Charleston. Like you can't buy an 11 unit for 200 grand. Right. It was supposed to cost us about a hundred to renovate all, probably 120 to renovate all of them. We're probably at 170, 175 just because every time we'd put something in, it, it would get stolen. Somebody would break in, tear all the drywall out. Yep. So we're trying to get in and get out as fast yep. as we can. Yeah, man. Uh, when I was when I was investing in the hood, the first thing that we would do is we would put security gates on every single exterior door. So like the screen door would be one of these security gates, you know. So like you cannot get in. They're drilled in with bolts that can only go one way. You cannot unscrew the bolts from the door. And then there's there's gates and there's glass, and uh, and that way nobody could break in. Uh, you know, obviously they can break into the windows and stuff. So sometimes we put bars on the windows. It was it was nonstop. But you got to just seal that thing up, renovate it. But it's like, why even deal with the headaches on that shit, right? Like, why even go? Th but once dude, you get the we, tenant, we in, all get started somewhere, though, you know. But once you get the tenant in, it's not as bad. Yeah, yeah. But it, but when they're just vacant properties sitting there being renovated, it's like everybody in the neighborhood sees the trucks pull in, and yeah. they just as soon as they pull out, they go over there and steal units. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I stick to B class, yeah. but the money in this, the flipping, um, when you flip C class, we've made great for sure, for yeah. sure. But, dude, some of my best returns are in C class and D class properties. Some of my worst returns also are in C class and D yeah. class properties. And your collections are horrible. Mm -hmm. Or mine have always been. I don't know what you're in looks, C class. It looks great on paper from a pro forma standpoint in C and D class areas. But dude, as if you've been in the game, man, and if you own that stuff, you know that it does not perform like it does on paper. Yeah. Right? Like what you see on paper is not how it performs. There's so much more turnover. There's so much more, you know, 
And the, dude, the turnover is the biggest expense in owning rental property. Yeah. The turnover, dude, all of a sudden you gotta you gotta evict them or they move out. They don't even tell you, you know, for two weeks it sits vacant and you're like, where's rent? And you realize they moved out. Then you gotta move all their stuff out. You gotta pay to have it all dumped. You gotta pay to turn the unit. You gotta pay a leasing agent a fee. And then you gotta, like, dude, the turnover is what you gotta reduce. And the highest turnover is in C and D class areas. So if, the more you can reduce that turnover, um, the greater your returns are gonna be. That's always the biggest expense in owning rental property. So the B class stuff, man, you just workforce housing it. is just, dude, it's, it's right down the middle of the path. It doesn't look as sexy on paper as C and D class, but I'm telling you, man, the returns are way better. Yeah, and I'm all about quality of life and lifestyle, and you don't deal, with, sure. the, you don't deal with the headaches in the B class that you do in the For C sure. and D class. For, dude, I have so many stories, so many stories about the, More the C and D catches class on stuff. fire in the C and D class. Mm -hmm. Do grease fires. Uh, wait a minute, you know, I fell asleep while I was, whatever, cooking a pork chop on a friggin' frying pan, and like, dude, half my building burned down a couple months ago from that. So, I've been through all of it, man. And the break-ins are nonstop, and, and it's usually like the tenant or the tenant's friend who, like, the tenant calls up their buddy, like, hey, that unit just went vacant. Like, run through there. I'll keep an eye out, blah 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 for the landlord. Dude, it's it's they game they game the system bad. So. And the whole neighborhood uses the dumpsters. So your trash oh, yeah. bill is your trash bill is oh. three times because you basically everybody in the whole neighborhood drives in, drops their mattresses off. It's all mattresses. Yeah. yeah. I've never <laughs> seen so many mattresses. <laughs> so like how are you how are you sourcing deals right now with how crazy the market is? Um, good question. We we're working our ass off right now to find stuff. Um, mailers, text, cold cold calling. Um, for the retail side, just cold calling homeowners. Um, yeah. On the fix and flip side, just calling sellers with, that have high equity. Um, so you're pulling lists with high equity, whether it's owner occupied or not, and just yep. letting them know, hey, the market's going gangbusters. Yeah. Um, we prefer. Or, like, I can list it for you, or if they don't need that much, or you know, if they're willing for to take a lesser offer, you guys will come in and buy it. Then. Yeah. Or then if they won't take a cash offer, then we just turn around and list it for them retail. Um, and then on the apartment side, cold calling agents. Um, both retail and commercial agents, yep. um, email blasting commercial and retail agents. Um, everything that I've bought on the commercial apartments or mobile home side has come from agents. Yeah. I don't think we've bought anything. Very, we've bought a couple of small apartments for, directly from seller, but nothing big. How, how have you built those relationships? Just because you're, you're an agent yourself and you're telling people, are you, are you sending out emails to all these agents and letting them know? Are you sending out text messages? Are you going to networking events? Like, how are you developing those relationships um, with, with these agents and wholesalers and all these people bringing you deals? Um, I think my name and branding got out there and people brought me deals. And then once they, once people see that you actually go through and close. You got to execute, right? If you don't execute, they're not bringing you shit again. But it, especially if you put something on a contract and back out. So we, we bought one deal off LoopNet from this agent up in the um, upstate of South Carolina and they bring us first crack or are yours is your stuff mostly upstate or is it down here around charleston about 50 50. yeah we own a bunch of stuff up near uh newberry okay you use the same management company they go all around that area yeah 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 will they come how far out will they go i'd say probably an hour okay outside of newberry which dude it gives you a that's a good radius man yeah a couple hours and they, they do a pretty good job but i mean you still have to manage the manager for sure from what we've seen. What, is that, what does that look like for you guys? What do you guys do there? Yeah, so I have an asset manager in our office. She's actually our construction manager. So she manages all the construction for the flips, which we don't do that many. We might have like five going up at a time. Um, and then she manages all of the rental properties. So she's looking at P&Ls. Um, she's looking at rent rolls, collections, just making sure that rents are coming in. She's making sure that expenses aren't going through the roof. Um, because as you know, if you don't keep an eye on that, it it can get out of control fast. You gotta question the management company. If, dude, if your eyes aren't on it, why the hell would their eyes be on it, right? Like, if this is your asset, you gotta pay attention to it. I, I look at the monthly reports and I, I just ask questions just so they know that I'm paying attention, yeah. right? And it's so crazy how know. you get on them and the number gets better at that next right. 30 days every single time, doesn't matter what, it, what it's about. That's it, man. You, got, you gotta pay attention to it. And I think a lot of people get fooled into this idea of, passive investment, right? And they don't have to look at any of this stuff and it just takes care of, I think, I think a lot of that is complete BS. I think unless you have an amazing partner where you know that you can stroke them a check 
and then they invest your money and then give you mailbox money and they're, they're high quality and they're aligned with your ambitions and aligned with your goals, I think the whole passive thing is, is really fluff, you know? Like, yeah. you have to, residual is very different than passive. Residual is doing something once, getting paid on it over and over again. Passive versus active, like you still have to be paying attention to the assets. You have to. How do y'all handle repairs? Like, I've done it with different property management companies. Where I hate is when they make 10% on the repairs yeah. because I don't feel like we're in the same boat rowing in the same direction because yeah. they're incentivized to do expensive repairs on. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So you, when I was, you're in a kind of this flux zone of, you know, you're, you're doing deals that are 20 up to 70 units. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's, dude, that's a sweet spot because you can find smoking deals from mom and pop sellers. You can get them at deep discounts. Uh, you, they're bigger than a lot, what a lot of like the entry level investors can get into. So it's, it's low competition. It's too small for guys like me who only want the bigger deals. Dude, that's how I built my portfolio. That's how I got up to over a thousand or up to around 600 doors initially. And then I started taking out hundred unit buildings um, because there's just a little bit more scale. But the reason I got, really the reason I got into big, the bigger stuff is because then I could have on-site management. Yeah. So I have on-site Man management, on-site leasing, on-site maintenance staff. Are they salaried? Yeah, they, that are just salaried, yeah. and then all the work orders go to them, and they take care of everything at cost. Got it. it you cannot do that with stuff 20 to 70 units because you've got to use the management company. So um, I think there's a couple different ways that you can do it. <clears throat> you could have a go-to vendor that you say, hey, this is the vendor that I want to use, and they're going to do everything at cost, and you just forward on the, the work order to them. You know, dude, maybe on your on your um, 50 unit, maybe you have one on-site maintenance person that you can pay and say, hey, all work orders go to them. They're gonna take care of everything. If you have somebody capable, you're gonna have to give them a, a unit. And by the way, dude, I never give anybody a free unit for working on my property. I pay them more and then they have to pay rent because if you have to fire them and they're not paying rent, it's really hard to get them uh, out. Yeah, that's, so you, that's you, a good little nugget. Yeah, dude, so you gotta pay them a little bit more and make them pay, pay you rent. And dude, if you ever go look to sell the property, it looks like lower revenue if you're not charging them rent. If you're charging them rent, it looks like higher revenue, higher expenses, but you'll still get Got it. a little bit better on that. So anyways, um, that's one way to doing it. Maybe you can't justify an on-site manager, but you could justify with 50 units an on-site maintenance person. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would probably lean on that. The other thing is I've seen management companies um, negotiate or you negotiate with the management company say, hey, Here's what I'm making right now on the property. Here's what the net income is. Here's or here's what the gross income is. Here's what the net income is. Here's what the cash flow is after debt service. Instead of me paying you, what are you paying them? Eight percent or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of me paying I think you eight, pay seven and a half. On yeah. The How about I pay you twelve and a half percent of the cash flow? So now they're incentivized the exact same way that you're incentivized is based on cash flow of how well the property not only nets but how much it it cash flows at the end of the day. Right. So, uh, so you don't give them equity, you give them, because I know some no, people, no, no. there's a couple I, people in our mastermind groups that have given yeah, property management um, company equity in the deal. And, and, and you could do that, I've, ha I've had that go south and I've had that work out really well. Yeah, because then you're married to them. Yeah, um, and, and if you give them equity, it needs to be more of a profit share than it is an equity, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, and this is, that's exactly what this is. It's more of like a, it's a, it's a percentage of cash flow instead of, um, instead of something else. So. Uh, but then you're aligned, right? You're in the same boat, rowing in the same direction. You give a shit about what is my cash flow at the end of the day, and if they can be aligned with that, how do you do that? Well, I pay them maybe a higher percentage off of the cash flow, which is a smaller number, um, than a smaller percent off of the top dollar amount, which it's not aligned that way, you know? Do you ever offer some sort of like, I guess a percentage when you refi out to drive the bottom line? You could, yeah, you absolutely you ever done could. That? Um, I haven't with my management company. I've definitely done it with my joint venture partners, my operating partners. I've done it with um, like project managers and stuff to keep the cost basis down. Yeah, because you want them driving that bottom line for mm -hmm. the appraiser, appraiser when you Yeah, and that. I want to keep my cost basis down so that way there's more of a spread for me and the investors. So, um, you know, my buddy, my buddy Hank that we're building 24, I'm sorry, uh, 82 townhouses with down in Savannah right now. Um, he gets, he's doing everything at cost. Um, he's not charging a spread. We are paying him kind of like a, a salary for 12 months. And then he gets a bonus based on 
how much money he saves below a certain dollar amount nice on the units yeah. and then he's got a little percentage of equity in the deal forever so now dude he's incentivized to get it done he makes more money the lower the price point is actually uh the l lower the cost basis is on each unit and he gets a percentage of the refi proceeds cash flow I depreciation like and all that stuff so dude we've played around with it um and i think it's a candid conversation i think you sit down and say hey caleb man here's where we're at i care about the bottom line and you care about the top line i don't think we're in the same boat rowing in the same direction how do we how do we align interests in this because i dude i want to work with you I'm, i got a conversation tomorrow or i'm sorry um the day after tomorrow with my management company up in uh from my north carolina mountain house i think they're charging a lot on the top line and i'm like that that disincentivizes me right and like it, it it just doesn't align and so i have a candid conversation with them i think the more candid you are and like you have the difficult conversations and you said dude they're like dude thank you for being so open with us thank you for yeah. shooting straight with us right and i want to shoot straight with them they want to shoot straight with me and we'll, we're going to figure out a way because we're both reasonable business owners yeah to make this make sense because i don't want to manage this friggin' thing and they don't want to lose like this this would be their premier property yeah and so it's like you know how do we how do we align interest so dude i think just sitting down with whoever the management company is and saying hey let's figure this thing out let's talk through it and see if there's a better way uh to pay you guys more for performing for the property performing better yeah. because then i make more my, my investors make more our joint venture partners make more um just dude, talking through it you know and everybody's worried about that conversation but i think if you just kind of hit it on the head it's you have great breakthroughs on that stuff yeah and having a conversation that way god that saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last couple of years when you go and sit down with someone and you ask them what they think is fair mm -hmm. because i'm so generous most of the time when i make the offer first it's more than they were even thinking yeah. when you put it on their plate and they they make the first offer most of the time you end up yeah. you end up winning to be honest yeah. well i think yeah i think um dude i'm in you know what's interesting is like <clears throat> if you've ever been burned for something i think you try to like overcompensate for it like i don't know like i hate litter right and so whenever i see litter i always go and pick it up and i go and try to like i, I instill it in my kids and i'm like uh, I talked to my wife about it. I was like, if somebody litters, they should be forced to eat whatever the hell that they litter. You know, like, I was like, I kind of like that. Like, you litter a, a, a cigarette butt, you should be forced to friggin' eat, eat it, it. You know, if you litter a, a coffee cup, you should be forced to eat this. And then all of a sudden, people stop littering. You know what I mean? Um, but I was in a bad business partnership where I felt taken advantage of from a partnership standpoint. It was a very unfair, in my perspective, uh, partnership. And now I overcompensate for that and I never want to be seen as that unfair person. Yeah. So then I'm like, let's give them this, let's give them that, let's do this. And my partners, you know, like on my, uh, like Fatty and, and Carlin, they're like, dude, there's a shitload of work that we have to bring to the table and a lot that yeah. we have to do that you're discounting right now, man. And like, you're overly generous and like, we need to figure out a better way. And so that's something that I've been really battling with because I want to be seen as fair, but the other side of the coin doesn't realize how much work really comes from our side because dude it is a boatload of work and i'm bringing an entire team versus one person on the other side right yeah and, and or vice versa you know so yeah i think um say hey dude what's fair to you oh well here's what I'm, and if you don't like what their offer is or what they suggest and you say hey here's what i thought was fair let's figure out why and you dude, just talk through it all and if you come to a an agreement great like dude i'm completely transparent in all of my negotiations and maybe it's not the best way to negotiate, but here's where, here's where it always works for me. I'm always willing to walk away. Yeah. I think if you're willing to walk away from a deal at any time for any reason, dude, essentially you get what you, what you think is fair out of that deal. Yeah, and the worst thing you can have is a uh, partnership with resentment, bottled oh, up resentment that where you're for not sure. having conversations. For sure, employees that way, your spouse that yeah. way, your business partners that way. You don't want anybody who, uh, because any time there's bottled up resentment, you tell yourself stories in your head and it goes down this dark, dark path of like the worst thing. Like I think Caleb's think, doing the worst things and he's trying to take advantage of me and he's an awful person. And, and dude, like it's all stories. And if I just sat down with you. Head. Think exactly. about how positive you and I are. Think exactly. about how negative the other person right. is usually not as right. optimistic but, as but, we And as they haven't plugged into working on their mindset. They haven't yeah, plugged exactly. in. Yeah, like, exactly. You know what I mean? So imagine how like, you got a story 
I got a story, and all, then they're going in different directions. Dude, if they go down two different paths for too long, it's like, it's irreparable, right? Like you cannot fix it. And I think you gotta hit that on the head. That's why it's like every time I have a difficult conversation with employees, with Kate, my wife, with um, you know family, with uh, team members, with JV partners, it's just, dude, you gotta hit it on the head early on and just set expectations and be completely open and completely honest like don't let that stuff bottle up and you, dude it just it, it's it works better right like everything is smoother on an yeah. ongoing basis that way so tell me where is the market headed um where do you see the biggest opportunities over the next 12 to 24 months what do your goals look like and your ambitions look like um, yeah so what do you really want to focus on and we'll kind of wrap with so that. i'd like to get to 500 doors by the end of the year um is there a reason? Is it more just that's the number, or is it that will yield a certain amount of revenue and income? Or actually, how did you come to 500? Yeah, so based on my income per, per door, it's going to get me to a number of passive income per month that where yep. I feel like it it builds a, a moat around my family. Yep. Um, so if I can get there, that'd be great. Um, I think the markets. I think we've got another 12 to 24 months of. Uh, a strong market. There's not enough inventory. Well, I mean, I mean, it, as as long as as long as demand is high, supply is low, prices will continue to go up, or prices will continue to stay high. Like, what what could adversely affect that? Everybody from New York already moved down here, or something, you know? Like, yeah, and I'm telling you, we're starting to see the masks fade away. Dude, Texas um, got rid of them all together. Right? Yeah, so I think it's about to open up a whole nother level coming here very shortly because there's still people that are bottled up at home um the weather's getting nicer yeah right i i think this summer is going to just be a shit show yeah um where sellers just sit in the driver's seat and they they call all the shots yeah, yeah. no it'll be it'll be interesting man so personal goal is 500 doors by the end of the year and then and then what do you do from there dude like once once your passive income is to a point where you know that you don't have to work anymore and you have the lifestyle that you want, you live in the home that you want, you got the assets that you want, you got to um, you know, provide for your family any way that you want, provide for others any way that you want. Like, How do you stay motivated and what does the next level look like? You know, that's a really good question because um, I've battled with that because I got to, I set a goal last year and kind of got to where I wanted to be and thought I wanted to just go play golf every day and I, I'm still a, a lifestyle guy. Like. I want to build my businesses around my lifestyle and get to the point to where I can do what I want, when I want, with who I want. But I still, I think when I get to there, I've got to find something that I can do with my time, whether it's volunteering or coaching um, local teams, or I've got to do something. I can't just go play golf and I can't sit at home every day. Yep. You and I are dude, too much motivation. I, 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 just, I don't think I'll ever retire. We're not wired that way. Yeah. Man. I go on vacation for a week. Like I, I know you just came back from uh, uh, the USBI, right? Yeah. And um, dude, I go on vacation for a week. I'm like, I'm like antsy to get back. I get depressed for like two days yeah. when I get back from vacation. I think it's, I'm so used to just a structured routine, and then I get off it for a week, and I drink and do shit to my body that I don't, exactly. I'm not used to doing, and I. It takes me a few days to get back on that runway and get going again. For sure, man. You know, you feel like crap. You're like, oh man, now I gotta like be overly disciplined because I was so lack, uh, lax in discipline for the past week. And it's just like, you know, these these routines and these cycles. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm saying right. If I'm not improve, if I'm not gradually improving, my mind me too goes the wrong way. I got uh, dude. I, do you think I'm actually gonna do a, a video on this? But do you think entrepreneurs are born or made? I think born. I think you're just wired that way. Um, and you see it at a young age with kids that are just like, the, the kids that go out and mow lawns and yeah. knock on doors and just, the, they have a little hustle in them. I, I, I believe anybody can be a business owner and have a business that does a million to a few million dollars a year. So I, th I think everybody could be an entrepreneur, but I truly believe, or, or like could, could have a business, but I do believe that you know the way that you're wired the way that i'm wired is definitely something that's like internally I, driven i agree and and i think if you want to build a multiple eight figure nine figure ten figure business um i don't know i i, I haven't met somebody who like was like oh no i was like content doing this and then all of a sudden i just decided to 
become a billionaire. You know what I mean? Like there's 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 something that's internally driving all the time. Like dude, freaking Elon Musk. Elon Musk hits he becomes the richest man in the world, right? And uh, and he and he posts on Twitter. He's like, oh, that's cool. Back to work. Yeah. You know, because it's not about the money, dude. It's about just driving. It's about impact. It's about achievement. It's about just you know upping the ante over and over and over again. I think. And um, it, it's 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 interesting, man. Like you sit back and you start thinking about this stuff. And uh, uh, Gina Wickman, who wrote Traction, he says, dude, entrepreneurs are, are born. They're not. They're I not made. agree. I mean, I've got kids that are. 12 and 14, two stepkids, and they're just both wired so differently. Where one, I could see one being an entrepreneur, and they, I mean, they both grew up in the same households, yeah. had the same instilled beliefs in them, but and then there's one that's, she's just wired to work for somebody. Yeah, yeah, she just has, has uh, it's, it's fascinating. It is, isn't it crazy, like, how, like, I'm one of four kids, and me and my siblings are all very different, you know? Um, you know, I'm obviously the most entrepreneurial. My, my brother, my other brother is like entrepreneur. He's more entrepreneurial. I don't think he would start his own business, but he would. He crushes and is a high achiever, and um, <clears throat> in what he does. But he's just not interested in like. I don't know. He likes the stability of having a job at the same time, but he's always trying to like invest in like houses and stuff on the side and like doing other ideas and dude he achieves at the highest level in, in everything that he does but he doesn't he won't go start a business but he's very entrepreneurial now as a kid where who was the bigger risk taker you or him uh who was more fearless probably me yeah there you go yeah i feel like if in everybody if the kids or when you grew up and you're fearless or you're just a big risk taker yeah that leads you to becoming a good entrepreneur i think competitive Fearless, risk taker. He's probably high more, energy. Yeah, he's probably more competitive than I am. But I'm very like, not that I don't care, but like, I don't give a shit about failure. I know that failure leads to success, so I just don't care if I do fail because I know I'm gonna get that much better, sharp in the axe. I don't want to fail, but um, if I do, I know I can pick myself up. I'm not worried about like worst case scenario, like. He very much is. He's very much, oh, but I'm gonna have my pension of $65,000 when I retire in four years from now if I just keep, I'm like, dude, go buy one friggin' apartment building, you're gonna make $75,000 a year for the rest of your yeah. life, you know? Like, you're gonna pick up a one, not work for another four or six years from for the government, you know? And uh, Isn't it crazy how it's that easy for you now? It's it's insane. Oh, I wanna raise? Just go buy an apartment building, it's $75,000 a year. Oh, I want to own another raise. Oh, I want to build my net worth. Like the deal that we did this week, built my net worth by seven and a half million dollars. Yeah. One deal. Then you look back 10 years ago and it's like, what was I doing? How much time did I waste? But it's also, you didn't waste it. It was stepping stones, you, was, dude. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going with it. You know, so it, I definitely wouldn't be here if I didn't screw up and, and mess up earlier yeah. on. It's just, uh, you know, and then I have another brother who, who is like, likes doing his own thing. But he's not going to go and build a business and light the world on fire to do 10 million, 20 million, 50 million, 100 million dollars. You know, he'll make six figures a year doing entrepreneurial things, but essentially owning his job, right? Yeah. Owning, uh, and I think everybody can do that. I think everybody can make multiple six figures a year, maybe even seven figures a year, like in their own business. Uh, but if I, I don't know, I, I do believe that at a at a level of Tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions. People are just wired a little bit differently. I agree. So, it's good stuff, man. Always good to catch up with you, brother. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me on. Dude, I appreciate you being here. And um, uh, we got to go and hit the links sometime soon, too. Whenever you want. Oh, Ron, Ron wants to play, too, and I think he's about your skill level. <laughs> tons of value, tons of insight. My dude, Caleb, he's a, he's a great friend of mine. Like I said before, like our... our Wives hang out together, we go golfing once in a while. I wouldn't worry about what he said about my golf game. I think he needs to worry about his own and I'll compare myself, because I'm getting better incrementally. I don't compare myself to other people. I compare myself to myself and making sure that I get better over time, all right? So, it's a quick little takeaway. But I hope you guys got a ton of value out of this. If you did, please share it. Please um, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please click the notifications bell and, um, and share it with some friends. Like if, 
there's other people who are gonna get insight out of it. If you got insight out of it, other people will too. And um, you know, we're trying to grow the, the, the channel and try to help other people get some of these insights. So uh, please share, I appreciate you, I love you. Until next week, see you on Spill the Beans. See ya.